Over the last week, many of you will probably have seen a video of Leon fans berating their own players through a loudspeaker, following a 4-1 defeat at home to PSG. That was Leon's fourth game of the season, and their fourth without a win, leaving the club which dominated French football during the 2000s, bottom of the league on table with more than one game played, for the first time since match day 34 of the 1982-83 season. Lyon went on to be relegated that season before owner and president Jean-Michel Erlas led the club on a miraculous journey to the summit of the French game. Nicknamed Le Gun, which is a slang term meaning the kids in Lyon's regional dialect, it is an apt nickname since Lyon's rise and success under Erlas was built on young players and an outstanding youth department. Erlas arrived in 1987, following Lyon's fourth failed attempt to win promotion from the French 2nd Division. One of his earliest moves was to implement the first modern development system in French football, looking to tap into the club's wellspring of local talent. Lyon is the third largest city and the second largest metropolitan area in France, trailing only Paris, yet Lyon had never won a single league on title, or even finished as the division's runners-up, before Erlas arrived. Nonetheless, Erlas, who made his fortune through accounting software, immediately outlined his bold ambitions for the club, titled OL Europe. As the name suggests, Erlas sought to take Lyon from the depths of the second division to the dizzying heights of European football, and he wanted to do it all in the space of just four years. Erlas wrote off Lyon's debts, and over the next four years, Lyon won promotion, finished fourth in Ligue 1, and qualified for the UEFA Cup. They haven't been relegated since. In the 2001-02 season, Lyon won their first ever Ligue 1 title, but they weren't done there. OL proceeded to win seven successive Ligue 1 titles, which remains an all-time record. In the space of just seven short years, Lyon had become the fourth most successful team in the entire history of Ligue 1. Even PSG, with the backing of an entire state and a budget five times the size of any other Ligue 1 team, are yet to win more than four on the bounce. In Europe, Lyon made the last 16 of the Champions League nine years running, owing to victories against the likes of Bayern Munich, Inter Milan, Liverpool, Benfica and Real Madrid. As recently as 2020, just three years ago, Leon knocked Pep Guardiola's Manchester City out of the Champions League with a 3-1 win in the quarter-final, and it took eventual winners that season by Munich to knock them out in the semi-finals. At the time, Leon had one of the youngest squads in the Champions League with an average age of just 24.4, and the likes of a 23-year-old Moussa Dembele, 21-year-old Hussam Oer, and a 16-year-old Rayan Cherki were among the most sought-after young players in European football, each valued at between 45 and 70 million euros, following in the footsteps of fellow Leon alumni such as Karim Benzema, Hatem Ben Arfa, and Alexander Lacazette. Fast forward just three years, and Leon lost two out of those three players on free transfers this summer. They finished seventh in Ligue 1 last season, failing to qualify for Europe in successive seasons for the first time in almost 30 years, and now they are bottom of the Ligue 1 table, with fans turning on players, players turning on coaches, and rival co-owners turning on one another in a combination of spite and stagnation that threatens to bring down one of French football's greatest institutions. It is little wonder, therefore, that I've had so many requests to make a video about Lyon. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to a city which is renowned for its food, silk, and architectural landmarks, but also for its football team, which dominated the French game like no other during the 2000s, but is now on its knees, as we take a look at just what on earth is going on at Olympique Lyonnais. It would be easy to blame Lyon's demise, at least in part, on Qatari ownership at PSG, and the way in which it has distorted the finances of the French game. And don't worry, I will do that at some stage. But an honest assessment of OL's downfall has to be traced back to before 2011. In the 2007-08 season, Lyon won their record-breaking 7th successive league on title, amassing 79 points to stave off the challenge of Laurent Blanc's resurgent Bordeaux. 
Still, it was the closest that anyone had come to Leon since the 2003-04 campaign. Victory against Sosho and PSG in the Trophée de Champion and the Coupe de France saw Lyon claim what was, despite their recent dominance, a first ever double and treble. What's more, it was two academy graduates at the forefront of Lyon's treble winners. A 20-year-old magician, heralded as the future of French football, and a potential Ballon d'Or winner from the age of 14 by the name of Hatem Ben Arfa, and a sharp-eyed 21-year-old goal-getter, who struck 31 times that season, named Karim Benzema. On the face of it, this seemed like the Leon project, or the Leon machine by this stage, working exactly as intended. But not everyone was wholly content. Jean-Michel Erlas, having conquered French football, had turned his attention fully towards success in Europe. Lyon were only actually knocked out of the Champions League in the round of 16 against Manchester United, who went on to win the competition that season, drawing one all at home but falling to a 1-0 defeat away at Old Trafford, and therefore losing 2-1 on aggregate. You might have thought that only losing very narrowly against the eventual winners, and a bona fide super club in Manchester United, getting out of a group containing Barcelona Rangers and the reigning Bundesliga champion Stuttgart, and winning a first ever treble, might have been deemed laudable, or at least an acceptable campaign, from manager Alan Perrin and his young group of players. But not as far as Erlas was concerned. Over the summer then, Perrin was sacked, a pretty phenomenal achievement after winning a treble, and replaced by Claude Puel. Meanwhile, several key players departed. Leon number one, Gregory Coupe, joined Atletico Madrid, but the biggest departure, and the most controversial, was that of Hatem Ben Arthur. The outstanding young player, not just at Leon at the time, but in all of French football, Leon had always expected to lose Ben Arthur but not for another couple of years, and only to someone like Manchester United or Real Madrid, both of whom had already expressed an interest. Instead, they lost Ben Arthur at the age of just 21, and to a direct divisional rival in the form of Marseille. It came after Ben Arthur, as would become a bit of a theme of his career, was at the centre of a couple of scandals and controversies. It was no secret that Ben Arthur and Benzema, despite coming through the youth ranks together at the same time and combining beautifully in the first team, didn't exactly see eye to eye off the pitch. That had long led to rumours that Ben Arthur might force his way out, given the calibre of the clubs interested in him, but in March 2008, he signed a new two-year deal. At the end of the season, however, Ben Arthur had a new enemy. Leon's first choice centre back, Sebastian Scalacci, with whom he had an infamous end of season training ground scuffle. When Leon tried to prevent Ben Arthur's move to Marseille, he accused the club of lacking class and described them as a small club. Leon wanted Ben Arthur to join a club from outside of Ligue 1, for obvious reasons, but he was having none of it, and the eventual 12 million euro fee reflected the distressed nature of the sale rather than Ben Arthur's true value or talents. To make matters worse, just 10 days later, Scalacci was also sold, joining Sevilla for 6.5 million euros. The previous summer, Leon had lost Thiago Mendes, Eric Abidal, and Florent Maluda, so they were used to regeneration, but it wasn't the ideal start for Claude Puel to put it mildly. Not only did Leon lose in the round of 16 of the Champions League once again, losing to eventual winners Barcelona, just as they had lost to the eventual winners the previous season, they also failed to win the league on title for the first time in eight years, dropping all the way from first to third place, finishing below Blanc's title winners Bordeaux and Ben Arthur's new club Marseille. It was Jean-Michel Erlas's wild ambition, which took Lyon from the second division to seven successive league on titles, but in some ways, that ambition could become all-consuming. And it was hard to argue with the fact that, in the summer of 2008 at least, it became destructive. The following season, despite the bitter blow of losing Karim Benzema to Real Madrid and club legend Janinho, Erlas did at least get the Champions League run that he had always dreamt of. Leon beat Fiorentina and Liverpool in the group stage, they knocked out Karim Benzema's new club, Real Madrid, in the round of 16, and then their domestic foes Bordeaux in the quarterfinals. 
It took Bayern Munich in the semi-finals to halt Lyon's best ever Champions League run, but as brilliant as those European knights may have been, Lyon fell short in the league once again, finishing six points behind title winners Marseille, and in the 2010-11 season, they fell even further behind, finishing a massive 12 points behind title winners Lille in third, and this time, Karim Benzema returned to haunt them, scoring in both legs as Real Madrid beat Lyon 4-1 on aggregate in the round of 16 of the Champions League. During the off-season, Claude Puel was sacked and replaced by Remy Gard, but more significantly, it was in the summer of 2011 that the Qataris acquired PSG. And all of a sudden, returning to the summit of the French game, for anyone, not just Lyon, became a monumental task. PSG's spending immediately began distorting French football, and since the 2012-13 season, they have won all but two out of a possible 11 league untitles. Given their budget, to be quite frank, it's an embarrassment that they haven't won all 11. But that's another subject for another video, and incidentally, one which I've already made, should any of you be interested. PSG's monstrous spending is the reason why they, rather than anyone else, replace Lyon as the dominant force in French football. But it can hardly be blamed for Lyon finishing 8th and 7th over the past two seasons, and now finding themselves bottom of Ligue 1. No, for that, Lyon, and indeed Erlas, need to look a little bit closer to home. For so long, Lyon led the way in terms of coaching, sports science, scouting, recruitment, youth development, and facilities within the French game. They were so innovative and well-organised that success became almost inevitable. And by the 2005-06 season, Lyon weren't just the best-run club in France, they were also by far the richest. Lyon were the 11th richest club in the world as measured by the Deloitte Football Money League, sandwiched between Liverpool and Roma, with revenue of almost 130 million euros. No other French club even made the rankings. At the time, there was no more dominant team in any of Europe's major top flights. By the end of the 2000s, though, other French clubs had started to catch up. Teams like Bordeaux, Lille, and later Monaco had not just caught up with Lyon, but began to overtake them. Erlas, who was not a young man by this stage, was still calling the shots, but he was no longer as hands-on in terms of his day-to-day -day management of the club. That wouldn't have mattered had someone else, equally or even more capable, have stepped into that role. But instead, a leadership vacuum emerged, and a lack of direction and organisation ensued. In short then, Erlas took his eye off the ball, whilst others had been forced to modernise and professionalise by Lyon's dominance over the preceding decade. Lyon's academy continued, and still continues, to produce outstanding talent, with a near constant pipeline into the first team. But so too do a handful of other French clubs, and in every other department, Lyon either stagnated or regressed. During their era of dominance, Lyon's success might have been built upon their own youth ranks, but it was always complemented by tremendous recruitment and player development. For every Karim Benzema, there was a Sonny Anderson. For every Hatem Ben Arfa, a Janinho Pernambucano. For every Steve Malbronk, a Michael Essien. Lyon were accustomed to losing their best players, but before they parted company with them, typically for very healthy transfer fees, they either had a replacement lined up or, more often than not, had already signed them. During their seven successive league and title wins, Lyon spent €226 million, Euros, the most of any team in the league, but they generated €210 million Euros in player sales, which was also by far the most of any team in the division. Overall then, Lyon won seven successive league on titles, with a net spend of just 16 million euros. PSG, by comparison, haven't won more than four in a row since their Qatari overlords arrived, during which time their net spend has been over 1.3 billion euros. What's more, Lyon were never dependent upon a single manager, head scout, or chief executive. Aside from Erlas, everybody else appeared to be interchangeable. Four different managers were responsible for Lyon's seven league and titles between 2002 and 2008, and a fifth, Claude Puel, was responsible for their deepest run to the semi-finals of the Champions League. It is unusual for a club to go through so many coaches during such a successful era, 
especially when they're not owned by a Russian oligarch who keeps writing blank checks, and are called Chelsea. But time and time again, Leon just seemed to get the big decisions right. In the late 2000s, and particularly into the 2010s though, as the club's leadership became lazier and Erlas more withdrawn, Leon started to get an increasing number of those big calls wrong. In some instances, arguably they were just unfortunate. Erlas's biggest target, perhaps during his entire three and a half decades at Leon, was Johan Gekov, who was, simply put, one of the best midfielders in world football during his time at Bordeaux. Gerkov was the man who inspired Bordeaux to their first league on title in 10 years, and dethroned Lyon in the process, and Erlas made it his mission to bring him to the Stade de Gerlon. In the summer of 2010, Erlas got his man, as Lyon parted with 22 million euros to earn that privilege. At the time, Gerkov was rightly touted as France's most gifted footballer, and, perhaps unenviably, a Zinedine Zidane successor in the national team. Unfortunately, that's not quite how things worked out. Gerkov had persistent injury problems at Lyon, though his mental vulnerabilities were perhaps even more significant than his physical ones. Gerkov was a football obsessive, having chosen the sport ahead of tennis at the age of 12, when he was France's best in his age group at both sports. He lived and breathed it, but he was markedly less comfortable with everything else that surrounded the sport. Gerkov never had the ego of Ben Arthur or the belief of Benzema. He shunned the limelight and was uncomfortable with celebrity. For a single season at Bordeaux, which deservedly put him in Ballon d'Or contention, he showed the French public what he could do, but he never really managed to show the rest of the world. His Lyon career was ultimately a tale of what could have been, and the club hasn't signed anyone of his standing, the best player in France, and one of the best players in his position in the world, in the more than 13 years since. Others, like Carter Cater, who was one of four underwhelming big money signings from Lille in the space of just four years, and Sergi Dada from Malaga, were perhaps just evidence of Lyon's declining scouting, analysis, and negotiating skills within the transfer market. On the management front, likewise, several key mistakes have been made. In May 2019, Erlas named club legend Janinho as Lyon's new director of football. Janinho's reputation as a player at Lyon is beyond reproach, but as a director, his first decision was to appoint his former Brazil teammate Silvino as Lyon's head coach. It was Silvino's first job in first team management whatsoever, having only worked as an assistant up to that point at one of the biggest clubs in France, and it proved to be far too big of a job for him. Following a run of seven games without a win, just nine games into his time at Lyon, Janinho was forced to sack his old teammate, with Lyon languishing just one point above the relegation zone. Lyon have made a few questionable appointments in recent years, but Silvino's nine games in charge set them back years. From third the previous season, despite his successor Rudy Garcia steadying the ship, Lyon fell all the way to seventh, their lowest league finish in over 20 years. Ligue 1 was Europe's only top five league not just to halt proceedings in response to COVID-19 during the 2019-20 season, but to actually cancel the entire campaign, deciding the outcome of the league table on a points-per-game basis after 28 matches have been played. That had a double whammy negative impact on Lyon, who not only missed out on vital revenue as a result of the season's cancellation, like all Ligue 1 teams, but also lost the opportunity to make up vital ground following their dreadful start under Silvino. Had the campaign not been cancelled, and, you know, a deadly pathogen not spread around the world in early 2020, Lyon almost certainly wouldn't have failed to qualify for Europe for the first time since the mid-1990s. Make no mistake, Lyon were already regressing, but the appointment of Giannino and Silvino, combined with the misfortune of Covid, significantly accelerated their demise. The following season, Ligue 1's enormous new TV deal with Media Pro collapsed. The deal, worth 3.25 billion euros over four seasons, was second only to the Premier League's rights deal in all of world football. Overnight, Every team in Ligue 1 and Ligue 2, other than PSG, was plunged into a state of crisis, staring into a financial abyss, and Lyon were no exception. 
Major adjustments had to be made to the team's budget, as Leon raised almost 100 million euros in player sales in the 2021-22 season, whilst only reinvesting barely 20 million euros. The outcome, perhaps unsurprisingly, was yet more decline. Having bounced back to fourth in the 2020-21 season, and a new manager, Peter Boz, Leon fell to eighth in 2021-22. Boz pleaded for more time as he looked to implement his ideas and a new style of play on a team that had become stale, and Leon actually made an excellent start to last season. No one bettered Leon's four wins and a draw from their opening five fixtures in terms of points, but as the fixtures turned, so too did the results. Laurent, Monaco, PSG and Lens always looked like a tough run of fixtures, but Leon lost all four matches. And as a result, Peter Boz lost his job. Erlas brought in Laurent Blanc as his replacement, at significant cost, in order to steady the ship. In fairness, Blanc did that at first and led Leon to some impressive results last season, most notably a 1-0 smash and grab away at PSG. It was enough to carry Leon up to 7th, but the football wasn't pretty, and fans weren't overly impressed. Blanc did an outstanding job at Bordeaux and Leon, but there long existed a suspicion in France that Blanc's assistant Jean-Louis Gasset was the mastermind behind much of that success and that it was because of that inconvenient truth that Blanc hadn't had a job in Europe since leaving PSG in 2016. In the more than six years between leaving PSG and joining Lyon, Blanc's only job was a brief stint with Al Ryan in Qatar, and in some respects, it has shown. Blanc's tactics appear to be stale, that all too familiar word, and unimaginative, in a league which has changed a lot since 2016, whilst he appears to have not. Following a disastrous start to this season, confidence in Blanc amongst Lyon fans has hit rock bottom. Many Lyon fans have accused Blanc of being lazy, disinterested, and of effectively wanting to be sacked so that he can take another six years out of the sport, or indeed retire, off the back of a healthy severance package. Blanc, it is often said, spends more time on the golf course than he does worrying about the plight of Lyon, or how he can mastermind a victory in the team's next match. A banner displayed by angry Leon fans at their recent 4-1 defeat to PSG, when translated into English, read, Laurent Blanc, if you don't have the balls to fight anymore, resign. Financially, Blanc would be much better off getting sacked than resigning, and Leon fans fear that is why he is hanging on. Blanc only signed a two-year deal in 2022, but it is reported to be worth €230,000 a month, hence Leon's reluctance to simply pay him off. Nonetheless, the situation is so dire now, and Leon's start to the season so disastrous, that it is eminently possible not just that Blanc will be gone in the coming weeks, but that he could have left before this video even comes out. It has already been widely reported that Leon have tried and failed to convince former Brighton and Chelsea boss Graham Potter to replace Blanc, and that they have since turned their attention to recently departed Wolves manager Julian Lopetegui. Given Blanc is still in the job, the whole spectacle is rather unedifying, as both club and manager seem to be torting each other into pulling the plug, but with neither of them wanting to act first due to the financial disincentives. All the while, Leon continue to lose football matches and endure the worst start to a league and season since the 1950s. Just two games into the season, following another 4-1 defeat, this time against Montpellier, when asked in his post-match press conference what Leon had to do in order to turn their fortunes around, Blanc casually responded, change the coach. In most instances, you'd chalk that down as sarcasm from an under-fire head coach in the immediate aftermath of a painful defeat. In the case of Blanc, however, it seemed like a genuine request for the board to just get rid of him with very little, if any, emotion in regard to Leon's fate. Most Leon fans are now desperate to see his request be accepted, regardless of the financial implications. Blanc isn't the sole cause of Leon's demise by any means, but he most assuredly isn't the solution. And so long as he is in the hot seat, a destructive toxicity and animosity will remain, and it's hard to see Leon turning anything around in those circumstances. During the 2022 World Cup break last season, rather significantly, Leon had a change of ownership after more than 35 years. 
Jean-Michel Erla sold almost 80% of his stake in Lyon to American businessman John Textor, who acquired the shares via his Eagle Football Holdings Limited for a fee of 884 million euros. If Textor's name sounds familiar, that's because Lyon isn't the first club the American has acquired. In fact, the name of his multi-club ownership business, Eagle Football Holdings Limited, was chosen because, at the time, Texter was looking to acquire both Benfica and Crystal Palace, both of whom are nicknamed the Eagles. Unfortunately for Texter, his bid to acquire Benfica never materialised, and he only ended up acquiring a 40% stake in Crystal Palace in exchange for his £86 million investment, so the name doesn't really make sense. Textor is still the largest individual shareholder at Selhurst Park, with over twice as many shares as anyone else, but because the club's other three major shareholders, David Blitzer, Josh Harris, and Steve Parrish, act as one voting block, with chairman Steve Parrish calling all of the shots, Textor has little to no influence despite his ownership stake. That has left the American increasingly frustrated at Palace and open to the possibility of selling his stake in the club and acquiring a controlling interest in another Premier League team. Before buying into Palace, Texter was linked with takeovers at Watford, Brentford and Newcastle, so it would be fair to say that he is not too concerned about his English allegiances. Palace's other two owners, meanwhile, fellow Americans Josh Harris and David Blitzer, attempted to buy Chelsea after Roman Abramovich assets were frozen in the UK, and before a consortium led by Todd Bowley, emerged victorious from that particular battle. It leaves Palace in the rather precarious position of the three men who own over three quarters of the club between them, all seemingly wanting out, or at least being open to swapping them for another English club instead, and their largest shareholder being very public about that fact. Texter wants Palace to be part of his multi-club ownership model, which he views as the future of football. As well as Leon and 40% of Palace, Texter's Eagle Football Holdings Limited also owns 90% of Brazilian club Botafogo and 80% of Belgian top flight outfit RWD Molenbeek. Texter's four clubs were all very strategically acquired. All four are based in talent hotspots, whether that be Rio de Janeiro or South London, with catchment areas covering enormous and proven talent pools, and there is a very clear pathway between, and use case for all of them. Botafogo covers talent in South America and particularly in Brazil. Molenbeek provides overseas players with the opportunity to gain enough points to secure a work permit in England. Palace compete in the most lucrative league in all of world football. And Leon were, not all that long ago, one of the giants of the European game with a massive stadium, attendances, and pedigree to match. Unfortunately, he and Steve Parrish seemingly no longer even see eye to eye, with very different ideas of how Palace should be run. That's why Textor seemingly wants out, but at the same time, he is well aware of the talent the club can attract in South London, and they have just opened a brand new state-of-the-art £20 million academy and training facility. It might eat away at Textor at night that he can't call the shots at Palace, and that Parrish's ideas diverge so far from his own, but so long as they continue to work, the value of Texter's asset, which he owns more of than anyone else, will continue to rise. Botafogo, meanwhile, are currently flying high at the top of the Campeonato Brasileiro, though they have been hit with a series of lawsuits in recent months, and apprehensions remain in Brazil around foreign investment and the multi-club ownership model since the Brazilian authorities opened Brazilian football up to foreign investment in 2022. Molenbeek have won promotion to the Belgian Pro League on Texter's watch, though also not without significant controversy, and they sit 11th in Belgium's top flight, five games into the season. Although Texter acquired an early 80% stake in Lyon, as part of the agreement, Jean-Michel Erlas was to stay on as president for the next three years. But that didn't last long. According to Texter, Erlis had buyer's remorse, and after he publicly stated that he wouldn't be dictated to by the club's new majority shareholders, Erlis resigned in May 2023 with the clear suggestion that he had been forced out. Now he is suing Texter for defamation, who paid him 10 million euros in exit compensation and named him as honorary chairman of the OL group during the not particularly amicable separation. 
Another controversial aspect of Texter's ownership has been his intention to sell Leon's women's team and, to a lesser extent, their sister team in the United States, O.L. Reign, based in Seattle, Washington, who won the National Women's Soccer League title last season. Whilst Leon's men's team have stagnated and declined over the last 15 years, their women's team have firmly established themselves as the best in Europe. Between 2011 and 2022, Olympique Lyonnais Femine won the UEFA Women's Champions League eight times, which is twice as many titles as any other team in the history of the competition, in addition to hoovering up domestic titles at home. Texter claims that the sales of O.L. Reign and O.L. Femine are because he thinks that the men and women's teams ought to be separate institutions, and that the women's team should be owned and operated by women, but others suspect that it is just an attempt to raise short-term cash. Texter provided Leon with an 86 million euro cash injection when he first arrived, but that hasn't stopped them from getting on the wrong side of the DNCG, France's notoriously strict football finance regulators, who have the power to monitor and alter teams' budgets. Leon's ability to do business has been significantly hamstrung by sanctions placed on them by the DNCG, owing to what has been described as financial irregularities. Over the summer, despite raising more than 100 million euros in player sales, Leon reinvested less than 20 million euros of it in new arrivals. Moussa Dembele and Hussein Moir, once Leon's most prized possessions, both departed on free transfers. Arguably Leon's best, and certainly their brightest player last season, Bradley Barcola, joined PSG for a fee of 45 million euros. Carl Toko Akambe fetched just one and a half million euros as he followed Dembele out to Saudi Arabia. The previous season, Leon lost the likes of Malo Gusto, Lucas Pacatar, and Leo Dubois. The season before that, it was Bruno Gimaraes, Joachim Anderson, and Maxwell Cornet. It is an unmanageable outflow of Leon's best players, which, even with the best recruitment in the world, would make it difficult to remain competitive. Leon most assuredly no longer have among the best recruitments in the world, and even an outstanding academy cannot stem the tide of effluent which surrounds it. Texter's plan is to take Eagle Football Holdings Limited, with their shares in four current clubs and possibly more or others in the future, public on the New York Stock Exchange with an initial $1.2 billion valuation. Ah, the beautiful game. That was reportedly scheduled for some time in 2023, though market forces and Leon's plight perhaps means now wouldn't be the best time to take the company public. As things stand, Leon are a mess. They still ought to have too much quality to go down this season, particularly in attacking areas, despite their dreadful start. But a broader malaise means their long-term fate is just as pressing of a concern. Leon have gone stale in terms of their tactics, coaching, and recruitment. Combine that with a first ownership change in over 35 years, an ongoing melodrama between the old and new owners, and continuing to sell their best players with little strategy anymore as to how to replace them, and Leon's broader demise, whilst more sudden at the start of this season than anyone could have foreseen, ought not come as any great surprise. That is it for today's video. Thank you all very much as of watching. Hope you enjoyed it or found it informative in some way. Probably didn't enjoy it if you're a Leon fan mind, but you know, everyone else. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on. For both this channel, HITC7s, and my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. And all of those links plus much more can be found down in the description below.